So the next speaker now is uh, Dr. Mary Horning from um, the Columbia, Columbia University Medical Center in the US. And you will talk about distinct differences in plasma immune signatures between early and late stage of ME-CFS. Please, a warm hand for Dr. Hornig. Thank you very much. That was really a master class that we just experienced. Um, it was a really wonderful introduction to uh, the concept that we, um, that, that led us to our research is really trying to find ways to parse out what we believe is perhaps a, some significant heterogeneity in MECFS, um, both on uh, the continuum of severity of illness, but also perhaps the duration of illness uh, in addition, and, and perhaps in terms of different stimuli that are uh, important in, in the uh, disorder. And we were really keen to try to find biomarkers that might help us to identify and parse out this heterogeneity. We have been fortunate to have many researchers, including Dr. Peterson uh, and a host of United States researchers. I second that motion, that uh, or third the motion that we should really have uh, a global uh, representation in our clinical uh, in our clinical sample sets and our patient population, not only. Uh, so that we uh, can get to answers faster, but also to ensure that there are, uh, that the answers that we're finding in one country or one location are generalizable to other areas. And there may be a multitude of stimuli, uh, including viruses, that could vary uh, in their identity, but yet have similar responses uh, across uh, across the world, and we need to understand that more uh, more uh, deeply. Um, we began our work looking for a uh, the XMRV uh, PMLV uh, answer uh, back uh, in 2010, um, and set up a network of uh, clinicians with uh, five sites at the 150 cases, 150 controls, the blinded, blinded uh, analysis, and have the samples that are still banked uh, that we're able to use, and also uh, fortunate through funding from the Chronic Fatigue Initiative uh, funded by the Hutchins Family Foundation to have collected and characterized 200 uh, subjects uh, along with matched controls and embarked on a, on a uh, very wide range of analyses, including the look for a pathogen, um, trying to define some of the immune signatures that may be associated with different subsets, metabolomics and proteomics. And more recently have completed a 50 case, 50 control subset analysis where we uh, are looking at the microbiome as well as uh, a longitudinal immune analysis with about 12 uh, year to a year and a half after the first uh, sampling. When I want to mention just for a moment the, the importance of the matched controls when one is looking for an, uh, the possibility that an infectious agent may be involved in kicking off this process. And so we match on season of the year, uh, we match on the time of day of uh, blood sampling because circadian rhythms can alter uh, these phenomena. And we also match on geography as well as more, some of the more classical matching variables like sex and age and uh, you know, uh, socioeconomic factors, race, ethnicity. Um, but uh, I think it's important to, to note that because it's really uh, critical, I think, for the, uh, the comparison because one can be fooled uh, if, you, if you collect all of the controls during the uh, flu season, for example, and you have uh, uh, cases collected in other times of the year, um, you can have very different results, both in terms of the pathogens that you might find, as well as the immune uh, disturbances. Uh, we, we've worked also with Dr. Montoya's group uh, doing pathogen discovery, spinal fluid study uh, with uh, Dr. D Dr. Peterson. Uh, I'll We'll show you some of our immune uh, results for there as well. Looking at some more unusual phenomena, trying to some patients who have uh, more, um, you know, uh, strange or different types of uh, presentations or a high rate of 
uh, development of cancers, particularly lymphomas, and trying to understand whether the uh, stimuli may, may be different there. And now we are just embarking on a new uh, collection of samples uh, that will allow us to tap uh, the microbiome at multiple time points as well as the uh, plasma samples at, at multiple time points throughout a year, um, utilizing the uh, clinician network, Dr. Peterson, as well as a, a number of other uh, physicians who were involved in these other studies. Uh, but we're hoping that this will be foundation for establishment of a center of excellence uh, in ME research that will hopefully uh, ultimately have a global component. I would like to emphasize, however, that the, re the reason that we continue to be concerned and really devastated by the crisis in funding is that although we were very happy to have NIH funding, Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, um, again, we're just starting this collection, it only covers uh, for half of the sample collection for, micro, for microbiome, immune and pathogen discovery, uh, banking of samples. It has zero dollars for actually running any of these assays. And indeed, we had to add um, half a million dollars in additional funds from, uh, from other sources in order to even be able to complete that collection. So the, it's, a, it's a very uh, important scenario uh, that we need to address and get uh, this problem of funding and, and recognition of the biologic nature of this as a disease that's worthy of consideration at the NIH level and other high-level research found, uh, funding agencies. We are used to using an approach uh, that helps us to try to connect, in a chronic disease state, try to connect pathogens as well as host responses to in, environmental factors to try to understand these uh, disorders. And um, our laboratory has uh, really embarked on uh, producing many of these techniques. There's a mass tag PCR can do multiplex assays to look for the agent um, with high throughput sequencing. And also, we just recently published in, uh, Ian Lipkin and, and the team at the rest of the lab at our center uh, have published a new tech, uh, about a new technique that will allow us to identify with sensitivity better than the standard molecular techniques any virus that has ever been found to uh, be in the um, uh, in the uh, in a vertebrate animal, so it's 1.7 million agents that are tapped through this one reaction and relatively low cost. So we're very excited um, about that and, and are hoping that that will increase our yield. I'm sorry, my headset is <laughs> sort of falling off here. Um, and we're also doing the uh, microbiome analysis, which is including both the bacteria in the gut as well as in oral uh, pharyngeal areas. Uh, where many patients are starting with a sore throat, swollen glands in the head and neck, um, and also the uh, fungal agents and through the micro microbiome uh, analyses. In addition, we also are used to, in trying to figure out what's going on with a chronic uh, disorder, to really add in the host response and use, do that through a variety of techniques, looking both at the RNA level through RNA-seq or uh, microRNA approaches to look at the abundance of uh, the, the uh, transcripts produced by various genes. We um, have data that are uh, about to come out in that, uh, in that regard, and these may tell us something uh, not only about which genes are expressed, but can also in be informative as to what types of gene variants may exist in the population. We know many immune response genes may be uh, a link in other disorders to vulnerability to infectious agents or to have an untoward or a prolonged course after, after an infection. So we're very eager to look there to see uh, both in terms of gene expression but also trying to detect the variants uh, in the genes that may be involved, which could help us to, for earlier detection. 
Um, I'll be speaking to you about our immune uh, marker analyses. Um, we're still analyzing the longitudinal data, but we're also beginning to use immune profiling uh, to look for antibodies that uh, may be to pieces of viruses or bacteria or fungi that uh, lead to an autoimmune type of response. And recently in Norway, um, as well as other groups have found that there is some suggestion that there may be autoantibodies to receptors that are involved in, in the adrenergic system, the beta adrenergic system in control uh, uh, of blood pressure and pulse and autonomic nervous system responses. And have been just recently detected in, 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 in ME. And indeed, as, as uh, Dr. Peterson alluded to, you know, rituximab uh, is a B cell depleting agent, is, is uh, also uh, used uh, not only in cancer agents, cancer situations, but also um, in autoimmune diseases. And um, whether, you know, uh, its safety and efficacy need to be really uh, determined in the, in the clinical trials, but does look uh, promising and suggests that there could be an autoimmune subset um, of disease, um, and we need to try to understand well, who that subset, uh, you know, uh, is and whether they have genetic factors, perhaps, immune response genes that are involved, as well as certain pathogens that may kick the process off. We also are using a phage approach uh, for uh, antipathogen antibodies, uh, again, using an approach that will allow us to look for an antibody to any virus any vertebrate virus that has ever been deposited in the, in the database. So that same 1.7 million uh, agents that, are, uh, that, that have uh, been identified uh, up, to, up till now. So that will give us a history. If somebody comes to us and they've already, the, the, uh, it was a hit and run event, uh, perhaps, or the viral agent perhaps has gone to a part of the, you know, to an organ system and is more remote, so brain perhaps, or, or uh, in, in uh, immune glands, if the virus is, is, uh, has retreated, is no longer circulating in the blood or in blood cells, um, we may still at least be able to find the historical trace that that agent had at one time been present uh, and led to uh, a reaction in the individual, and then tried to see whether that really is associated with the onset and or persistence of disease. And we're also using metabolomics um, as a tap, not only for looking at uh, the host machinery, but also as a representation of the gut microbiome, because many of the uh, metabolites that are put into the bloodstream by the gut microbiome shape your immune system. Sixty percent of your immune cells traffic through your intestines, are exposed to products as they traffic through your intestines, exposed to products of bacteria, these metabolites of bacteria, and uh, that shapes the immune system. It can increase Th17 cells, which are inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cells, and then lead to an increase in IL-17, as well as uh, decrease the T regulatory cells, which may help to suppress certain immune responses. Um, the approach that, we, that we've used is a 51-plex uh, for the studies that I'll be showing you today. It's a magnetic bead-based immunoassay done on a Luminex platform, has fluorophores uh, that are uh, on the bead, and then a secondary fluorophore to uh, help you to uh, quantitate. So there's the identification of the cytokine or chemokine, uh, as well as the, uh, the quantitation. And we've identified, uh, we put together a panel that makes sense to us not only in terms of what we know about viral infection, but also with respect to the whole host of agents um, that, uh, you know, bacterial agents that, that could also play, play a role, but also innate immune molecules that are uh, known to have a, a role in brain responses. Your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis has cytokine receptors. And so for IL-1, uh, at, you know, beta, IL-6, and, and a host, and TNF-alpha. So we've tapped into those um, in, in building this, um, this assay. Sorry. 
Um, we uh, know that there is uh, signaling that occurs within the brain, the TOL3 receptor that uh, Dr. Peterson was describing. This is, uh, a f this is amped up by amplogen um, and can lead to activation of these Im innate immune signaling pathways that lead to the production of inflammatory cytokines, including IL-1 beta, uh, as well as a host of other downstream uh, cytokine uh, cytokines and, and, and chemokines with additional effects there, thereafter. Type 1 interference, I, I, uh, IFN, alpha, and beta, um, and then also viral type, uh, in the type 2 uh, interferon as well. And these all play a role in re, uh, brain physiology uh, as well. Why else might we want to look at uh, circulating cytokines if we're looking at a disorder that is, you know, it, that is involved with uh, cog cognitive uh, difficulties? Obviously, there are m muscle difficulties in the overall bodily and systemic fatigue, but we, we're very uh, keen to try to understand the range of cytokines that uh, may have a, have a role in sympathetic nervous system activity and the overall regulation of the autonomic nervous system response. Again, the antibodies, autoantibodies have recently been detected to beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptors, and we think that this, uh, that perhaps the dysregulation of blood pressure and pulse or the improper regulation uh, in, in, uh, along with orthostasis uh, may uh, be uh, regulated in part by uh, improper cytokine uh, increases or decreases over time. And we need to understand that more. And, and in building our assay, we were trying to include these, uh, these cytokines so that we could understand this better. There are also allergy-related cytokines, IL-4, IL-13, IL-17A, IL-10, eataxin, um, because we know that there are many pathways uh, through which the immune cells are interacting with uh, with uh, various cytokines and leading to both the eosinophilic uh, and uh, uh, inflammation as well as uh, histamine production as well and a variety of other uh, agents that can alter not only fever responses like prostaglandins but also uh, can regulate blood pressure uh, and other vascular responses including histamine. So, um, we, uh, in our uh, combined analysis of uh, the NIH uh, study population as well as our chronic fatigue study population, um, we found that there were some very intriguing uh, immune signatures that were present early in the course of illness, but that also, and I think the, the title is a little bit misleading, uh, as we're focusing on the ability to perhaps have something that would identify patients early on uh, after onset of disease, because diagnosis is often so delayed. Uh, but we also found some uh, differences from uh, con healthy controls in individuals who had long duration MECFS. And so we defined this uh, as we found our cutoff as three years or less for the short duration or recent onset individuals and long duration being greater than three years. And we found that duration of illness was, was more important than severity of illness in show in uh, identifying these differences in our, uh, in our population uh, of MECFS and, and contrasting them from healthy controls. And what we found was quite interesting is we had, had uh, in the short duration subjects, we had an increase in uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-12, P40, IL-17A, these are the short duration here versus the long and the controls, and interferon gamma. And in many cases, the uh, long duration uh, were uh, different than the uh, short duration subjects, and also uh, there was a difference from, uh, from control subjects as well. Um, there were also the so-called counter-regulatory or anti-inflammatory TH2-type cytokines uh, that were uh, increased in the short-duration subjects as well. IL-4, IL-13, eataxin, um, as well as IL-1 receptor antagonist. And I'll note in a moment that there, you know, the uh, 
uh, IL-1 receptor antagonist is, uh, there's a mimic of it, if you will, in anakinra, which is an agent that uh, was mentioned by Dr. Peterson. And so some of the you know, questions that we have had is that if the short duration subjects have an increase in IL-1 receptor antagonist, perhaps that you don't want to add more to that mix, but perhaps you would want to, in the long duration subjects, if there's this decrease, um, even though it's not significant, that perhaps amping up their, uh, their cytokine response, either through amplogen or through uh, direct administration of IL-1 uh, receptor antagonist, could potentially be of benefit. Similarly, for short duration subjects, um, agents, antibodies to uh, IL-17A or interferon gamma could potentially be used to dampen down the response for, uh, to, uh, uh, to these cytokines, and perhaps uh, it could potentially be, uh, be helpful. There are many commercial antibodies, I think there's four or five of them now, of, uh, for IL, against IL-17A monoclonal antibodies that are used in a wide range of uh, autoimmune diseases. So this gave us this opportunity to really think about the possibility that there, uh, of course, it needs replication. Um, and we also want to understand what happens to individuals over time. So we're waiting for our longitudinal uh, immune analysis to see over the course of a year to a year and a half what happens to cytokines uh, over, over time. But the opportunity to perhaps use a blood test that might enable physicians who are uh, primarily using uh, non, you know, clinical measures, uh, maybe they can use uh, orthostatic uh, intolerance as a, as a contributor to diagnosis, but we really need as much as we can to, uh, to, to help in this process. So we're very eager to understand that uh, uh, and to, to see whether this holds out uh, over, over time. Short duration subjects um, have a very uh, uh, limited regulation. Uh, this uh, there's a network uh, diagrams. All of the uh, cytokines that are included have been uh, those that have passed the multiple comparisons tests. Only CD40 ligand is in red here, connecting to uh, to IL-12P40. So that's the only down regulatory mechanism that's present early on in disease. Whereas later on in disease, it's it's a wild, uh, you know, dysregulation with many red lines, which means that there are down regulatory pathways there, um, and it's more uh, intensive regulation than uh, one sees uh, in uh, in the controls. Although there is also down regulation here as well, um, so we believe that there this may be part of the uh, understanding. These regulatory networks may help us to understand why there's this apparent immune exhaustion that occurs in the late onset of disease. Um, it doesn't seem to only be, uh, of course, people who are sick for longer or get, you know, older, and so have to control for age. And so change, differences in age did not uh, account for uh, these, uh, these differences alone. There were su subsets at many different, in many different age groups um, with these various cytokines, distinguishing between short and long duration subjects. What was most uh, intriguing was that although the interferon gamma levels were small, there was a 105-fold uh, uh, increased risk of being a short-duration subject, being early in, during your disease, um, if you had an increase, for every unit increase in interferon gamma, and highly significant. This is almost never does one see a, an odds ratio of that, uh, of that magnitude. But also uh, some increase with IL-12P40, pro-inflammatory cytokine, uh, as well, but some had uh, a, a decrease uh, association. Um, we found that uh, in a study with uh, using uh, some very uh, uh, presciently collected samples from uh, subjects with ME from Dr. Peterson's collection, which is probably one of the largest and longest standing co uh, collections, um, we also looked at these cytokines using the same panel um, in spinal fluid of, of, of ME subjects and compared them to uh, subjects with MS as well as non, no disease controls. And I just want to mention for a moment that the duration of illness uh, was, uh, there was a wide range. There were some that were earlier on, uh, but the, the ME uh, subjects were uh, on average eight years uh, uh, out from their, their onset of illness. 
Um, and uh, consistent with what we found with the long duration subjects in the blood, we found decreases in many of the same cytokines, almost non-existent IL-6. IL-6, is it, it, intriguingly, is extraordinarily important in memory models. IL-6 knockout mice don't have the capacity to lay down a memory. Um, so their longer-term memory, taking something from short-term memory and commemorating it in longer-term mem mem memory uh, is impaired. So we wonder whether in the central nervous system, if this is really so diminished, whether that may uh, be associated with those symptom complexes. And we need to do further studies to, under, to understand that. Um, and uh, the, so, and sim similarly, many of these were, you know, all reduced uh, as compared to the no disease controls. Um, so, and when you looked at the uh, correlation between uh, time uh, since uh, onset of illness and the cytokine levels within the ME subjects, you did see that the ones who were shorter dur duration um, had slightly higher levels, and then it started to decrease over time. But we had, uh, didn't have as many subjects who were um, early in the onset uh, of, of their illness. IL-1 receptor antagonist, really quite low here again. Again, could a, a, an agent, you know, like anakinra, which is IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, would that, uh, you know, recombinant, would that uh, be of benefit if you could get it into the central nervous system? Um, you know, uh, that, that's another challenge. If you're, you know, taking it peripherally, you don't necessarily get it right into the central nervous system. Again, dysregulation, uh, differential regulation in, in chronic fatigue syndrome in the central, in the central nervous system, um, with IL-1 receptor antagonist being a key regulator of down regulation in the central nervous system, um, whereas there's no, no particular downregulator in the no disease controls. Um, and IL-1 beta um, and uh, be, being a, down, a decreased uh, factor for risk of ME, whereas eataxin, an allergy-associated uh, eosinophil uh, 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 drawing um, chemokine, um, when, it, when that is uh, increased, um, there's a higher risk of, uh, of ME as compared to the controls. Just want to conclude on some of our thoughts about how we can pull together the gut microbiome with the immune system and the metabolome and to try to understand the system more comprehensively um, and perhaps allow us an opportunity to think about other uh, means of addressing the immune disturbances uh, in addition to or, as, you know, as an alternative to uh, immunomodulatory drugs. Um, because we think that pro and fun, you know, that probiotics may also be able to serve as a, as a, uh, as an immunomodulatory agent of sorts. Um, we know that in our diet we have uh, a variety of, uh, of amino acids, in particular L-tryptophan is one that is particularly of interest because it is a, uh, uh, the precursor of serotonin, which of course is involved in a whole host of neurovegetative functions, you know, that, that uh, you know, your sleep, your eating, your sex drive, uh, as well as your, you know, contributing to some of your vigilance uh, and, and, uh, and mood regulation. But also melatonin, which is a very potent immunoactive uh, a agent, but of course also regulates circadian rhythm uh, and, sleep, uh, and sleep cycles. Um, but the, the tryptophan can be taken away from the serotonin synthesis and, and melatonin synthesis by being shunted down this kynurenin pathway. And we're now looking at these metabolites through metabolomic uh, analyses and find disturbances in kynurenin in, in, uh, in, in ME that uh, look suggestive. Um, and interferon gamma and TNF-alpha induce the enzyme that takes it down this pathway. In addition, glucocorticoids, product of your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, reactive oxidative uh, uh, stress uh, uh, species, reducing agents, activate another enzyme called tryptophan 2,3-dioxygenase, and this goes down. And these have effects both in brain and in the white blood cells. And there are a variety of agents that are considered to be uh, regulators of, uh, of, of IDO, including T. Gandhi, herpes viruses, chlamydia, and a variety of extracellular bacteria as well. Um, the pathway just, uh, again, it's important both in memory function, immune function, but it occurs in the brain as well as in the white blood cell. 
Um, and it's a necessary process. And so if you don't have, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't get to the end of this process, um, uh, you won't have memory, uh, you know, good memory processes. IL-6 is uh, a participant here along with NAD+, which will alter the synaptic activity, modulate synaptic activity in hippocampus and cortex. But a variety of effects at glutamate receptors uh, as, as well as um, in, uh, you know, that, that can increase excitotoxicity and some which can be protective. But again, it's taking it away from serotonin and melatonin uh, uh, synthesis, and both viral infection and stressors can uh, set this process off. In your white blood cell, it's the source of autoimmunity when you go down this process. So you shift from Th1 to Th2 uh, type of phenotype in your T cells, and you are leading to an autoimmune vulnerable state. So we're very keen to try to understand this and to put it together with the cytokines that are associated uh, with, these, uh, with these processes. And just in our very preliminary analysis, this isn't dissecting according to uh, ME, but rather in the entire population, we do see a relationship. If you can't find serotonin in the, uh, in, in the, in the blood, Again, so it's suggesting that there's uh, a movement of tryptophan away from serotonin synthesis and activation of this pathway. So for, win for individuals who have non-detectable serotonin in their blood, they have higher levels of cytokines that are known to activate this pathway, interleukin-1 beta, TNF-alpha, IL-12-P40, IL-17-F. Uh, uh, as well as chemokines that are associated with interferon gamma uh, uh, and are induced by interferon gamma, so CCL2, CCL3, CCL5, eotaxin, et cetera. And again, so this hasn't been separate. The, these relationships hold in individuals who are healthy controls as well. We want to understand whether there are some subsets that we can uh, tease out here. Um, and this work is, uh, you know, takes many, uh, many, many individuals, um, and uh, in particular, um, the astute uh, characterization of uh, the, the the clinicians in our network, um, uh, Dr. Peterson, as as well as our other as our other clinicians, um, really so important to the, you know, to any quality that we might hope to have in our research begins with the uh, appropriate characterization, um, the appropriate controls uh, and matching of subjects, um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the ongoing persistence despite the, the difficulties in, uh, in funding and just, you know, keeping on with this, uh, you know, very uh, challenging disease uh, to, to try to make inroads. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Honig. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions before the coffee break, I think. So, one there in the middle. Do we have a mobile mic or do I have to get some exercise? Again? No, we want to have this on, on uh, the web film, you see, the recording. To be. Do we have the other one? There it is, okay. Thank you. So just a second. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice to hear that it's a lot of work done already, and I hope it will be a lot of... Is it Closer and a bit louder, please. Like that? Okay. Uh, I hope it will be more done than it is already. Uh, but the... My question is rather practical. You have shown a lot of data with uh, a lot of variations, I guess, between individuals in all these interleukins that you have measured. What is your suggestion for physicians? Which parameter it's better to look for to classify the severity of ME? Well, I, th I, I, my personal feeling is, is that we, we, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think that we, we need to, um, 
have more research to be certain of this phenomenon, to know uh, how patients individually change over time. The studies that I've shown you today are cross-section of uh, individuals who are all at one moment in time, and they vary in how, you know, how long they've had uh, illness. And I think it is premature for us to really uh, generalize or to, you know, to, to state at this point that we can, um, you know, jump right into using this as a diagnostic tool. I think it is promising, um, and I do think that we will we'll get there soon, but um, I, I do think that it's re very uh, important to maintain the clinical characterization that we, we know is so important um, because ultimately we will need to know how patients, you know, present clinically in addition to any laboratory uh, tool. We hope that this will help as a differential diagnosis, perhaps, um, if there's overlap in various types of uh, dis disorders. But when patients are very ill, I know that they're, you know, they're, they're again, you know, I mentioned some uh, tools that, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson mentioned, Anna Kinra, that I mentioned uh, antibodies to IL-17A and, you know, and so forth. I can't recommend that somebody, you know, looks at those sorts of things, but I think that um, if there are, um, I think it would be of benefit, which is, isn't apparently done in many other disorders, even with TNF-alpha or uh, inhibitors or with uh, antibodies to IL-17A uh, for other diseases. They, you know, it's not, they don't use these blood tests uh, to determine whether somebody should uh, get the, um, you know, get this uh, as a particular treatment. I think it that should change. Um, you know, I think that we should be monitoring these uh, so that we can understand and have some predictors, perhaps, as to who would respond to these various agents once we're a little further along and we understand, you know, if, if we can replicate the result. I think that's really key, in, key as well. Uh, I just continue with the same question, if it's possible. Is very short. Okay. Very short. Uh, because uh, I, I know the problem for physicians that will come. If they look on something which is rather low level of, the, of some of the patients, they always say, maybe you had this from your birthday. How to know that it's come together with the illness? Well, that, that, is, that is a, a very, uh, you know, key factor. I think that at, at the, at, for the onset of, you know, uh, at the onset of illness and the initial diagnosis, um, it, could be, it could be challenging. Uh, we have yet to actually create um, really good reference ranges for many of these cytokines uh, in the literature just for normal, healthy individuals as well. Um, and so that's also really important. Um, I do think that it's very critical. I've seen patients, for example, who've been on rituximab, um, and a year later, um, you know, I, we weren't informed that the patient had been on rituximab, and I looked at the cytokines, all the B-cell-related cytokines were uh, so low, you know, to almost non-detectable. And, uh, you know, I questioned whether the patient might be on, you know, have been on rituximab, and it turns out that it had been a year previously, so there was a, you know, a continued suppression of the, the B-cell-related uh, cytokines um, over, you know, course of more than a year, which could, you know, potentially put, uh, you know, a patient at, at risk. It could also be associated with, uh, you know, with benefit uh, in, in other cases. But the importance of getting the blood tests, putting it in context with other uh, factors, repeating the test to be sure that it's stable over time, because cytokines do change. They change even through time of day. We uh, routinely draw between 10 and 2 uh, you know, uh, at a clock each, you know, each day to try to minimize that circadian variation.